Well, you certainly got your money's worth, Mr. Melville. These February nights are the longest of the year. Well, you can both rest now. Believe me. I shall not be resting for some time. Why? You got your story, eh? Well, your plot. It's all there. Maybe it wasn't the plot I was after. No. What then? Something else you've given me tonight. What's that? The courage to go where one does not want to go. Mr. Melville, what you've heard, what I've told you, will it all be of service to your book? It will be a work of fiction, Mr. Nickerson. Inspired by truth. But I don't believe I'll feel the need to use all of it. Thank you. Yeah. Take that with you. No. The money is for you. I insist. I insist to keep it. And I insist one person in this conversation is sober. So it's back to uh, Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Well, good luck. Thank you. You know, I heard a man from Pennsylvania drilled a hole in the ground recently. I found oil. That can't be true. I heard it too. Oil from the ground. Fancy that. Welcome to episode 61 of the Monday Morning Critic. Today we have author Nat Philbrick. Nat, I'm so happy to finally get you on the show. It's great to be with you. Yeah, so I have so many questions. So, like, I'm going to give you the most obvious question. You probably get to your ears, just (laughs) can't take it anymore. And that is about writers that have influenced you. And I'm going to tell you, the authors that I've had prior to you, every time I ask this question, I get uh, Kurt Vonnegut. What would you say about writers that have influenced you? (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, I've I've been heavily influenced by a lot of write, writers. Uh, I mean, the one I I always keep going back to is, is Herman Melville, Moby Dick. Mm. Um, not that I write like a Melville, but he just had a huge influence on me uh, in terms of you know a lot of my topics are maritime. I live on Nantucket, the port of the Pequot, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, so so he's a big influence. I was early on. Um, uh, very influenced by William Faulkner, and, um, and so, uh, as well as you know, the, the kind of the usual ones, uh, Ernest Hemingway and uh, Fitzgerald was also a big influence. Yeah, and you know, just going through your your work, it, it, you definitely see that. And one of the questions I had for you down the road, but I'm going to ask you now because you you brought it up. I really feel like, um, and I don't know if this is possible. Is it possible for Moby Dick to be the one of the greatest and most underappreciated books of all time. Oh, I think that's exactly it. Um, it's you know, it's it's one of those books everyone knows about. Uh, uh, has some have read, some have decided they're just not you know 
interested in it. But yeah, I think it's it's one of those um, it, you know it, it's it's highly influential. It's a book everyone knows about. But you know, I think precious few have actually gone it really gotten into it deeply, and uh, which is too bad because it's really worth the effort. And I would just. Uh, the older you get, I think the more accessible Moby Dick gets. It, it begins to open up uh, as your own life experiences get broader. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't start reading Moby Dick until 31, the age Melville was when he, he wrote it. Because, uh, wow. you know, you just need to have some kind of life experience there. Yeah, I, and I totally agree with that. You know, um, but, but I, I want to circle back to that because there's certainly a, a few things I want to ask you. You're, you're born in Boston. You grew up in Pittsburgh. You mentioned off here that, you know, dad teaches there. Um, you get a B.A. in English from Brown, an um, M.A. in American Literature from Duke. Um, Nat, how much does all of that play as far as your your ability to write? I mean, being a writer, in my opinion, a lot of it is, is, is a gift you've been given. Obviously, you have to harness it. But how much does Brown and Duke and, and per- perhaps a family member like your father play into you being the writer you are today? Yeah, I think my dad has a huge influence. Um, you know, we, we just were in a literary household. Uh, books were everywhere. Uh, that was uh, something discussed at the dinner table, that kind of thing. Uh, so, and, and to this day, he's now retired uh, to Cape Cod, but he's um, uh, read and commented on just about everything I've, I've read as a prof- professional writer. And, you know, I don't know how much uh, Brown and Duke ultimately ended up influencing me as a writer. I, I never took any uh, creative writing classes. Uh, I took you know, basically English classes throughout those. The place that did was a huge, um, really, I think, turned me into a professional writer was my first uh, journalism job, which was uh, working for Sailing World Magazine, uh, which is, was then in Darien, Connecticut, but is now in the Newport, Rhode Island area. And, uh, you know, that I had been a competitive sailor, so sort of knew about sailing, but um, uh, it was a young staff, and uh, go, having to circulate, you know, an article among the staff, get two readers, uh, get the devastating feedback and then going back, revising and getting it done on deadline was really important. I think it really professionalized me in my approach to writing. It was, I began to realize it's not all just about gazing uh, romantically out into the sunset and being inspired. A lot of it is just working at it and, uh, uh, doing it in a professional manner. Yeah, and, and your passion for writing and your passion for sailing, it, boy, does it scream in your, in your work. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you, and this is probably another question you get often, um, you know, it's important because kids want to become good writers, whether it's, you know, college or high school or middle school. What, what's the, and, and this is probably, like I said, a question you get a lot, what's the advice you give to kids when they say, you know, what can I do to be, not necessarily be like Nat Philbrick, what can I do to be a writer like you are? What can I do to aspire to be as, as successful as you? What, what do you tell kids in that scenario on that? Yeah, I, first you got to read a lot. Um, just read it all the time, and then you've got to write a lot. And uh, you know, it doesn't make any difference what kind of writing. You can, can be poetry, short stories, uh, articles for the school newspaper, but or, or just a journal. And uh, but you just got to write a lot. And and I think the other thing, um, which is almost just as important, is you've got to share your writing with others and get feedback and mm-hmm. learn how to use that feedback in a constructive manner. You know, don't take it as, as uh, something threatening, but something as that uh, can genuinely make you better. And I think that because if you're going to improve as a writer, you got to put your time into it, and you've got to be uh, be able to to edit yourself and uh, make the writing as clear as it possibly can be. Yeah, that's really well said, Nat. You know, and I think you can apply that same thing in almost any field. You know, you have to be receptive to wanting to be better. You can't be offended at if somebody wants to improve upon your craft or your ability. It's it's it's, it's something you have to kind of receive with open arms, as opposed to being feared at, as people are making judgments about your writing. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's hard because you know this is often it it's, it means a lot to you. It's it's something you've worked on very hard, you know, and if you think it's pretty good, and someone points out that, you know, some, some things that, that could be improved, it's very easy to get defensive. And mm. just remember, uh, the ultimate goal is to make the writing as good as possible. And that uh, it's much better to have that kind of feedback before the 
writing is out there and, and potentially a larger to a larger audience, it's better to get those uh, that feedback early. Yeah, that's well said. You know, and and uh, you you mentioned you you were editor of Sailing World, but you also at Brown you you're the first. And I thought I read you were the first intercollegiate all American sailor. Where where does this passion come from? That like you love sailing and you're obviously really good at it. I mean, talk about where that came from. Yeah, it's kind of strange having grown up in Pittsburgh, <laughs> which is not usually associated with being the nautical mecca of the universe. But uh, my grandparents on my mom's side had a summer place on Cape Cod, uh, and they had a 12-and-a-half-foot wooden sailboat called a Beetle Cat. And uh, we'd go there for one or two weeks every summer, and I just loved that, that time, getting out on the boat. By the time I was 10 or 11, I was able to sail it by myself, and the, the sense of independence and freedom and uh, the interplay between the water and the wind, just it just, I don't know, it, it was magic to me. And so... Uh, when, when we go back to Pitt, by the time I was a teenager in Pittsburgh, I convinced my dad to buy my brother and I a sunfish, and so we started sailing that on the lakes uh, around a man-made, la- a man-made lake outside Pittsburgh, and uh, where they had a sunfish fleet, I began to race, and it just sort of one thing led to another. Yeah, and it seems like a pretty, I mean, to me, sailing seems very complicated. You know, I worked with a guy, um, great guy, who retired, but before he retired, he bought the kind of boats you're talking about, and he, like, fell in love with it. It was like he met another woman. He, he I tell you, he's a happily married guy, two kids. I'm telling you, I, Matt, I've never seen anything like it. He started sailing, he fell in love with it, and I I don't know, what it, what could you compare it to? I mean, it's not really a hobby. It's For you, it's a passion, I mean, I don't know. I guess my, my, my question to you is, um, how long did it take you to learn to be an effective sailor to the point where you really knew what you were doing? Yeah, well, you know, this is where I think the, a boat like the Sunfish is just so great. It's, it's the VW bug of sailboats. Um, <laughs> you can buy a used one for hundreds of dollars. They last forever. And uh, they're, they're fairly easy to learn how to sail on. And if you get into any trouble, if you capsize or something, you can write, uh, bring them back upright uh, very easily by getting on the dagger board. And so, you know, the sunfish, uh, uh, you, know, you can, in a summer, you can really learn the basics of, of sailing. What's good about a boat like the sunfish, which is only 13 and a half feet long, uh, looks kind of like a bloated uh, ironing board with a, a well in the center for your feet. Um, the good thing about it is it's, so, it's small enough that you have a really intimate connection with the water and wind. And, uh, you know, your, it's, it's, your sensitivity to all that uh, is, is developed very quickly. And, and uh, yeah, so, I, I, you know, if, you, if you've got the time at a, a lake, for example, um, it's a great, great way to get into the sport. Yeah, it's, it's it's an amazing sport at that too, and and, and you know, um, you know, just going through your life here, you know, you you've just come out with a book, and I'm going to mention this at the end. Um, it's called Second Wind. It, it was available in stores March 6th. I think you can get it on Amazon as well. I'd really love to hear the details about this because I was reading the synopsis online, and I really was. It, it seemed like a really interesting memoir. I, I really think people would love reading this. Yeah, but it's, it's it, you know people ask me what's your favorite book and and I, I cannot determine my favorite book in terms of quality. That's for others to determine. I uh, I think of books of, of what I was doing when I was writing them and was it fun or difficult to to work on them. And and Second Wind uh, is my favorite book. I think it recounts the most important year in my life uh, when I. Um, wrote my first work of history, A Way Offshore, A History of Nantucket, and decided to launch a comeback. I had been a stay-at-home dad for the 10 years previous to that. I was 36 years old. I was getting kind of pent up. You know, all my friends were uh, deep into careers, and and I had been at home with the kids, and I had lost contact with sailing, the sport that had once meant everything to me. And uh, in in, in in 1980, uh, 92, 93, my youngest son, Ethan, got into first grade, which meant he was uh, away at school till 2.30, which gave me an incredible amount of uh, uninterrupted time. <laughs> and so I, I started writing that history and decided I also wanted to launch a comeback and try to win the Sunfish North American for a second time, 15 years after having won it uh, at a 22-year-old. 
And so this recounts all that. And uh, uh, it, I, it's my second wind year, I refer to it. And, you know, and that, that was a long time ago. I'm now 61. And uh, my kids are now in their 30s. They're approaching the age I was when all this happened. And uh, it's, it's, it's been fun to, to have a chance to share a story from so long ago uh, with, with an audience now. Yeah, and I can imagine the love you have and just, you know, just reminiscing, going back and just really looking at your life. I mean, you're still doing amazing things, obviously, but you look back like that. And I guess my question to you is, and I ask this to actors a lot, because many people want to be actors with the aspirations of, you know, the glitz and the glamour. What they don't see is the people that fail and, and, and really have a difficult time making it. So as an author, when you write like that, is it just a matter of writing because you love it? Or do you feel like a, a sense of stress at times where, oh my God, I got to get this next book out. It's got to be a great book. You know, I hope it sells well. How, how do you, how is, what is your mindset as it, as it applies to, you know, writing and, you know, just putting forth something you love? How do, what's your mindset on that, Nat? Yeah, it, it's, it's, each one of my books sort of grows organically from what I had done prior to that. You know, each book seems to, in terms of topic, seems to lead uh, from the other. And I'm, I'm just finishing up uh, my third book about uh, the American Revolution. And uh, which is unusual for me to stay in the same uh, topic and, and time for for more than one book, and um, and yeah, and you know, at, at some point you just have to say, I, I want to write this book. It's you know, I, I'm you know, I don't I write these books not because I'm a big expert on the topic. Before I go into them, I, I write them because I'm curious about the topic and want to know more. And so for me, the research is kind of an act of discovery that um, uh, for me is exciting. I'm learning and I try to convey that kind of excitement uh, in my, in the book um, and, and try to find angles that are new to most people and, and, and at least to me as well. So, you know, yeah, there's always anxiety. Um, you know, it's, it's not all, uh, you know, it's just one one adrenaline rush and and they, the, your writing goes goes well goes bad uh, uh, all that kind of thing and, and and when a book does finally come out there's inevitably some anxiety how is it going to be received is anybody going to read it you know all yeah. those kinds of things but what I like about the writing life is that each book is different from the one before it mm. so you know you never fall into any. I don't feel like I ever have fallen into a rut just because each new book is kind of terrifying. It's a whole new topic. You know, how am I going to do this? And um, and so that all for me, it all leads to you know, it keeps keeps it fresh. Yeah, it's really well said. You know, and, and I stumbled on your you know a, a while back, and and I really really love in the heart of the sea, and, and I kind of thought, okay, here's somebody who loves the sea, who loves. And then I got into, you know, The Last Stand. You really have a beautiful way of, of writing. I, I, it's, it's a very easy read. It's very informative. You're, it's very apparent you're somebody who does research upon research. Like, there's no question in that. So I, I guess my question is, how much of it is writing kind of just to write? How much of it is, is consumed by research when you write a book? Or does it depend on the book? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Because I've, I've thought about it. I, I, I would guess that three quarters of my time is spent researching and, and, um, and assembling the notes and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, which is a lot of time. And, and the, the challenge is since I have to read so much stuff, go to the archives, visit all these places, the challenge, um, uh, is to be able to organize the material and, and, maintain your own voice as you write because you know you're writing all this you know you're you're reading things from all sorts of coming from all all over the place you know some of them academic history some of them blogs journals you know whatever and um and so the the challenge is um to, to sort of keep keep it in your head as far as the story you want to tell uh while also um uh having all of this information available to you in an organized way uh, that is accessible as as you 
begin the writing process. And yeah, it's, it's not easy. No, and it doesn't come across that way. But in 2000, you published, you know, you published New York Times bestseller and, and my person, one of my most favorite books of all time. And that is in the heart of the sea. You know, it's a National Book Award for nonfiction. Um, you know, Ron Howard made it into a movie in 2015, which I believe is so underrated. It's such a wonderful movie. Um, so I guess I, I wanted to ask you a few questions about that. How happy were you at, at the way your book was adapted? Was it something, were you proud of it? Were, were you Were you kind of, um, did you wish certain things were in it that were not? How did you, how did you feel about that, Nat? Yeah, well, you know, it was great to work with Ron Hour. He's just a really big guy, and um, and and you know, what's so, it's just such a different process. When I wrote in the Heart of the Sea, it was me in my study with all my research materials, um, writing a story in which I could come, you know, talk about. Well, we don't know this, but it could be this way. You know, all those kinds of things. And and when you make a movie, you have to. You, you have to determine what's going to happen. You can't just, you know, you can't uh, have that, those kinds of ambiguities. And uh, so it's just, it's just a different way of telling a story, and it's also a collaborative medium. It's, it's a screenplay, and then, you know, then it gets much more complicated than that, the cinematographer to, you know, all this other stuff. So, um, yeah, I was I was happy with the movie. You know, it's a movie. It's different. It's, you know, it's, uh, and I, I had great respect. I, I really felt that uh, the, the the filmmaker had to have his own creative vision. That you know what I what I came up with was the book. It's obvious where I stand. That that's what I I did, and um, I knew it inevitably was going to be different. And uh, hey, I, and when I first saw it, I thought it was really cool. So um, uh, you know, it, it does take liberties. It, it is different, but. Um, you know, I, you have to do that to a certain extent to make it work. Yeah, and you know, when I interview some authors, um, not the, some of them say, you know, um, you know, I wrote the book, and, and whatever the screenplay writer does, he does. But I swear, I, I watched an interview where Ron Howard said, you know, we use this, we use Nat's book as the Bible. You hardly ever have a director say that. So that's a testament to your writing. You never have directors say that. Yeah, no, and he he, he was he was good. Um, you know, and he inherited the script. And the script is different, but you know, it's this is how it works. And uh, no, and he, he really was fun fun to work with, and he's just a good guy. Yeah, and and you know, for those that don't know, it's about the, the ship Essex, and, and you know, there's you know, it's it, these it's it's about a whale, very similar to the buildup of you know the Moby Dick and so forth. When you're doing research on this, and and, and you know, kind of a bringing everything in, are you moved by a story like this? Is is it something that I know it's passionate for you, but does it ever become something more than that? Uh, yeah, it does, particularly in the heart of the sea, because, you know, um, I, I do get emotionally involved in my work, and um, and 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 it's funny, with the, writing each chapter, I get so into it, I sort of lose track of where it's going to go. Uh, you know, I, I um, it's not, it, it, it and, and so as I write a chapter, and it, it's going badly, I, <laughs> I really feel bad for everybody. And so these poor guys, you know, the, the story of the Essex uh, is, is obviously the real story that inspired the climax of Moby Dick, but mm. where Moby Dick ends with the sinking of the Pequod by, by the white whale is really where uh, In the Heart of the Sea begins because it, it then turns into this uh, uh, survival contest that the men take to their whale boats and spend uh, almost three months at sea and are reduced to survival cannibalism and all this kind of thing. And, you know, so I, I had, you know, I, and while working on this, I'm, I live on Nantucket, which is from, from where most of the crew members came from. And uh, that, for example, the house of the first mate and the captain are still standing. They're not far from where I live. I, I visited the, the, the graves of, of, of you know, some of the survivors who ultimately died on the Antucket, you know, I just really had identified with them. And so when, you know, as they go down one by one, um, you know, throughout the, the story, it, it was, it was pretty heart wrenching. It was, it was hard. Mm. You know, and, and, and yeah, it's really well said, you know, and I, I really loved Chris Helmsworth as Owen Chase. And, you know, it's, it's just a thing you met, you mentioned cannibalism, like, 
I didn't personally know this story, and when, when you see that, it's like, wow, and you read about people gnawing on bones, and, you know, you, you, you mentioned Melville a little bit, and it's so interesting because, you know, one of the liberties you talk about in the movie is where he sits with Thomas Nicholson, but in reality, I guess he, you know, he met with, you know, Chase's son, and they talked a little bit. Um, how much did, did, you know, Melville took some of it out of his own personal experience. He definitely took some out of, you know, this story. It's a, is it a 50-50 blend, you think, that? How does that work with Melville? Did, did he... Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's, you know, he had been a whaleman, so, you know, and, and that was absolutely essential to him when it came to being able to write a, a, a novel about whaling that... Uh, had the verisimilitude that Moby Dick had because he had been there, he had seen it. But, he, you know, he also, it's what's always amazing to me, the more and more I, I return to Moby Dick, is what a what a writerly and readerly novel it is. He, he, he was reading all sorts of source material while he was working on this novel, uh, from uh, Owen Chase, who was the first mate of the Essex, the, the character played by Chris Hemsworth. He wrote a um, an account shortly after returning to Nantucket after the disaster. And, and then, you know, but Melville just ra- ranged all over the place when it came to the literature of the sea and of whaling, and it's all in there. And, and so, you know, his, his voice is, you know, comes from, you know, it comes from his own experience, but also is so reflective of what he was reading. And, and um, you know, the, the novel reads... You know, is 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 actually you know reads an iambic pentameter at times. It's Shakespearean uh, in many ways. You know, it's Miltonic as well. He was reading Paradise Lost. He was reading a Daniel Hawthorne. You know, and it all just is in there in, in incredible synthesis. Yeah, that's well said. You know, and, and there's a scene, and, and I, I, I could not, I was racking my brain to see if this is one of those scenes that's in both the book and the movie. There's a scene where, you know, Chris Helmsworth's character towards the end of the movie is in one of the whaling boats, and he's about to throw that spear into the whale, but, you know, he holds back, and he almost looks the whale in the eye and decides not to. What do you think, why do you think he did, was that a matter of the whale kind of saying, I win? Is it deeper than that, where he had a respect for, you know, the price he had to pay along the way to get to that point? What's your theory on that? Yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it's the kind of scene you see in a lot of sort of monster movies, I guess, where, I don't know, like Kong and stuff like that, where you, you get sort of an interaction between the human and uh, the monster or the, you know, nature or whatever and you know what interested me because that that scene never happened in real life Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, chase in real life continued to wail for for the rest of his professional life you know he didn't have any kind of aha moment where he realized how bloody and brutal it was but the fact is uh, there is a real basis for for that scene in that um uh when after the whale attacked I'm talking about the actual story of the Essex. After the whale attack, uh, uh, first rammed into the ship, uh, it 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 uh, it was knocked out and it lay stunned beside the the Essex. And Chase, um, at that point, picked up a harpoon and thought about trying to kill the whale that was right there, but saw that the the tail was very close to the rudder and feared that if he provoked the, the whale, it might damage the rudder and they were thousands of miles from land and that would be a bad situation so he didn't do it and as uh the cabin boy thomas nickerson would later write uh if he had known what was going to happen next he would have gone and, and, and killed that whale and so you know it's, it's very different from what the way it is in a movie and yet you know what interested me were the the, the, you know, the liberties the movie made you could sort of find uh uh, parts of the actual story that they were reflecting. Yeah, and whether it's your book or the movie, if you ask me the definition of tough, I'm going to tell you it's a guy who's been through cannibalism, months at sea, and then goes back to that profession after all that. I mean, it's 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 unbelievable. Yeah, you know, you know the, the, these guys were Nantucket whalers where there was only one thing you could do is whaling. And so, um, you know, they, they tended to view this as kind of an act of God, like getting hit by lightning. And, um, that, and in fact, uh, uh, Captain Pollard, who was the captain of the ship, would later say, um, you know, you, you, know, you, you don't 
won't get hit twice. <laughs> you know, they have an old saying on the second. Of course, with him, it would. On this, that next sail, sailing whaling voyage, uh, he would uh, his ship would once again get sunk, go up on an uncharted reef uh, off of Hawaii, and he would be once again forced to the whale boat, and that would be the end of his career. But, um, yeah, you know, they, these guys, their only option was to go whaling. And so, yeah, it took, you had to be tough. I mean, I know I would have been, if I had been on those whale boats, I would have been in the fetal position sucking my thumb and crying for my mommy. <laughs> lucky enough to make it back to Nantucket. There's no way I would have gotten out there again. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. And, you know, it leads my next question for you. So, read these nightmare tales of these awful fishing industry stories. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that that was one of the reasons why I was kind of, uh, I didn't really expect in the heart of the sea to be that as popular as it was because, you know, in the 20, 20th century or 21st century, we don't like whales. You know, we, you know, we like whales. Mm. And, uh, and I have had readers who said, you know, those, those Essex crew members got exactly what they deserved uh, <laughs> uh, because they were whale killers. And, you know, that, it, it was a different time and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of, of the current state of, of whaling and, and sea fisheries and stuff, you know, in the heart of the sea, I don't like to repeat myself. I like to try to do different things with each book. So, you know, I, I, I wrote In the Heart of the Sea. Um, that was my um, uh, survival tale. Uh you know, I, I, maybe one day I'll, I'll come back to the sea in terms of something similar, but I, I needed to go somewhere else after that. And um, although, you know, the, the, the water will always be a part of, of, uh, of what I do just because it always seems to, to work that way. Yeah, and I had a few more questions for you, Nat. Thank you so much. And one of the things I had to ask you is I, I love hearing your passion about Moby Dick because you and I are on board. We, we both view it the same way. You know, is there a specific, I know you have a, a fondness for Melville in the book itself, is there a particular moment in Moby Dick where every time you reread it or, or read it or think about it, get, I don't want to say emotional, even when we're over the top a little bit, but it, it, it resonates with you, it stays with you. Is there a part of the book that you, that you, love, that you love more than others? Yeah, well, you know, it seems to shift <laughs> with, with time. I mean, initially when I, I first read it, as a senior in high school, it was the opening chapter that just overwhelmed me. Uh, that images of the citizens of, of New York on a Sunday making their way down to the battery uh, so that they could look out in New York Harbor and, and the ocean beyond in search of the ungraspable phantom of life. Oh my God, you know, being landlocked in Pittsburgh, that really hit me. I was harpooned. And, um, and since subsequent to that, I, I, I've, you know, really gotten more and more entranced by, uh, by Ahab. Not that I'm, you know, a huge Ahab fan, just that his darkness is, is so fascinating. And, uh, and his interaction with Starbuck and, and all that. And then this Queequeg. And so you know, it varies for me. Um, I, I just find that the, each time I, I, I read the book, it, it's, a, it's a new book. I, I'm, I'm, I'm finding things I hadn't discovered before. Yeah, you know, it's not easy to. My, my dad's a Vietnam veteran. He's a he's a bronze medal uh, bronze medal valor winner. There, there's not much that brings him to tears. Your book did, the the movie did, and and I knew that was a success. I almost feel the movie's very underrated. I, I really I was blown away. Oh, I do too. I do too. And, and um, uh, the, the, as a sailor, and, and a lot of I know a lot of my friends who do sail are you know really like the book the movie in 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 a way that is, was not reflected at, at, at how it was received. And, and I think, you know, a lot of Ron Howard's movies uh, were not as, you know, were not as that well received initially, but we're watching them 20 years later. And, and I think uh, hopefully that will hold true in, in the heart of the sea. Yeah, it's one of those pleasant surprises you watch, and it's like, oh my goodness, you're blown away by it. So I was really happy to see that. Is there a, um, a time period of history you're targeting next, Nat? Is there a, maybe for something you're, you've been thinking about, you know, uh, spitballing? Is there anything, is there a particular time in history you're targeting for a next book? Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'll see. I'm, I'm finishing up. I've got a book uh, about my third and final book about the revolution. Uh, is about the year of Yorktown. Um, mm. It's called In the Hurricane's Eye. 
and takes up right where my previous book, oh, Valiant Ambition, ended. And it's coming out in October, and it's on the midst of that's getting copy edited and all that kind of stuff. And so, but, you know, after that, I'm not sure. I, I, I really, you know, one of my, I really loved going west uh, with The Last Stand, and I really miss the west. I, I um, you know, and after having spent the last three books on the East Coast, working my way kind of from New England uh, to, the, to the South, uh, you know, I may want to go west again. Um, uh, so I, I, I've yet to figure out what I'm going to do, but um, uh, I, I, I'm thinking that might be the case. We'll see. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, I, I think it's awesome to get, and you have a ton of these awards and honors and reviews. It's unbelievable how well received your books are. Like, obviously, in the heart of the sea it is well received. And then when you start to look at reviews, that you know, Last Stand, my goodness, they're through the roof. Does that? I mean, it must make you feel good to have that happen. Obviously, but say if it was the other way, say if it was, say if they were poorly received, would that get under your skin? Would that? I mean, I, maybe that's a stupid oh, question yeah, asking. Yeah, something. no, I don't think you're. If, if you're a human being, <laughs> you know, the, the, the critical reviews do get to you. And, and there's an unfortunate tendency, I think, in human nature to remember the negative stuff <laughs> long, far longer than the good stuff, which is really not the way it should be. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah, that's part of what happens. If you're going to write a book that's, that's going to be read by people, you just have to steal yourself or... Um, it being received in different ways, and um, it is. Uh, and and as a writer, I think uh, people just have to say, "Hey, um, uh, you know, it, it got published, and people have read it. And no matter how they respond, the big thing is that the book is out there, and it's available for readers to read." Yeah, and, and people clearly love your work. I mean, they keep coming back. They give you great reviews. And have you ever read a ne negative review where somebody just didn't understand, maybe didn't understand the book or just gave it a poor review based on lack of knowledge or maybe, because I see that in movies a lot where people give a bad review, but I feel like it's because of lack of understanding, not because of the final product. Oh, yeah, that, it, it happens to every writer. And, um, you know, but I try to do my best to, to keep on plugging and, um, but you know, it's, it is part, it's part of writing, it's part of life. It's, you know, it's not all <laughs> roses and, 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 uh, uh, birds chirping, <laughs> but you know, I, I think the, the big thing is, is try not to let it shake your confidence in yourself and to, to focus on what matters. Um, I mean, for me, it's very important by the time a book is published that I know what I'm working on next so that I can. Uh, I've got something to, to to focus on that will distract me from the reception of the book that's about to be published. Because you know, there's there's really nothing constructive um, to be gained by obsessing on you know how your book is being received. Um, it, it's it, you know it's, it's out of your completely out of your hands. And so when I go on book tour and or something like that, when a book comes out, I I really. Um, spend as much as I can time as I can uh, researching and figuring out the next one just so I have something else to think about. How do you like reading in that I'm sure you've done this obviously you the format where you read to an audience whether it's at a bookstore or so forth. How do you like that situation? Do you like being in front of your fans, your people buying your book, reading a, a, a chapter or two? Oh I do. I, I, I really do. I know a lot of writers are frustrated by book tours and stuff and would just soon be home working. But no, no, you know, I spent three years on average with each book, and um, and I'm, most of those, that time I'm by myself with my dog working in the basement, <laughs> and um, and I, I really enjoy the chance to get out and actually talk to people and and to meet readers and and to get their feedback too. I, I, I think um, you know talking to them is great, but I really enjoy um, uh, the questions that are asked. And, um, you know, and I, I think it, it doesn't hurt as a writer to get that kind of feedback. I think to get to know your audience and, and what are the things that resonate with them and, and, and all those kinds of things, I think it, it's helpful. So, so for me, I, I really do enjoy the event. gets me out of the house. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, it, and it gives me, you know, social interaction, which helps to keep me sane. Although, I have to say, you know, a, a, um, a major book tour is, is, can get long. And, um, 
and, and require too much time away from home, but at least it has the benefit of being temporary. That's true, very true. And, and my last question for you, and, and thank you so much for this interview, is um, what do your kids think? I know they're a little older, you mentioned they're in their 30s. What do they think of dad's career? What do they think of, you know, that their father's wonderful book in The Heart of Sea was made into this awesome movie? What do they think about your other fantastic, you know, books? What, what are your children's perception of you and, and what you do for a living? How do they see it? Um, they've always been very supportive, but one of the things that has always ruled their family is that uh, my kids and my wife have always um, uh, entertained a healthy skepticism about my enthusiasm. Uh, but they're very good at keeping uh, me in check and, and keeping things in perspective, and I think that's very healthy because the uh, writing life can be a very obsessive and self-absorbed one. And, uh, and there's a danger in that because I think if, if you become if it comes too much about you, you really lose your perspective uh, on on life and your material. And so um, one of the things I love about my family is they, they don't let me get away with much. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I think they they've been very supportive. All of them have. And uh, but. Um, uh, you know, God bless them. They they keep me. They they they're they're very willing to 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 mock me when it's appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> he is award winning author Nat Philbrick. He is his newest book, Second Wind, is out now. Uh, Amazon bookstores, Barnes and Noble, so forth. Nat, I cannot thank you enough for being on the show today. Oh, it's been fun. 